Let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come to you on our knees or sitting down, um, all of the places that we are, Lord. We come to you saying that you are a mighty God. You're a good God. And we thank you, God. Our hearts are overflowing with gratitude because of who you are, because of how you've blessed us, because of what we have. And God, I want to say even of what we don't have. We praise you and thank you. You're so wonderful. We know, God, that when we confess Jesus as our Lord, when we have faith, and sometimes our faith may not be as strong as other times, God, we know that you honor that. We know that you condescend to meet us where we are. You extend your hand, Lord, when we're weak. You give us knowledge when we're ignorant. You give us power when we're weak. And you give us guidance, Lord, when we're lost. There's so many reasons to be thankful to you, Father, and for our health, our families, our children, um, our jobs, uh, our houses, and... Um, Lord, our relationship with you above everything else. Father, we come to you um, as broken human beings. We're all weak and frail in, more, in some areas more than others. And Father, we are all on the same plane level when it comes to sin and temptation. We have all been born with this natural tendency to not do what is right, to put self first. And God, if we have offended you and sinned in any way this week, we come to you as a body of believers asking for your forgiveness, not based on our good things that we have done in the past, but based that you, on your mercy, that you're kind to us. And it's your goodness and your kindness to us that leads us to repentance. Father, we come to you giving you all of these names that I mentioned tonight or this morning, excuse me, Lord, we, all these names that we had just mentioned, we bring them to you, Lord, that you will activate your mercy and your healing and your power and your encouragement to those who are depressed, to those who have lost jobs, who are struggling, to those, Lord Jesus, who have a loved one who has come down with this pandemic, this virus. We pray for those who have the virus, like my wife's uh, um, uh, co-student. Lord, we pray for all of these individuals. We pray for those who, um, uh, family members that I mentioned, we pray that you will continue to be with them. And uh, Father, we thank you for jobs uh, that are still intact. And... Um, we, I can't remember everything, Jesus, but all of these that we just mentioned, we place them in your loving hands and that you will guide and direct. And Lord, bless us as we talk about you and your word, the subject for this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit will pervade every room, every phone, every, every person that is watching me by phone or by computer. We pray that you will bless. May the words that I speak, Lord, uh, reflect the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'll allow me to grab a couple of swallows of water. <laughs> I mentioned earlier, I, uh, I don't want to talk about the virus uh, for the last number of weeks. I know there's a lot of uh, um, ministers um, and there's a lot of good messages that are being preached out there on hope, um, how to cope, uh, things of this nature, and I just applaud them. I really applaud them, and um, but uh, I wanted to just take a detour from all of the news of, of COVID-19 and talk about something just completely different. And so uh, I'd invite you to listen to what God's Word has to say this morning. Let's have a prayer. Lord, 
um, as we open up your word. And as I share your word, Lord, sermons and presentations are always tainted by the individuality of the person speaking. And God, I pray that in spite of my imperfections of speech and of thought, I pray, God, that you will bless anyway, that your word and Jesus will be exalted, that we will come to an understanding of you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My sermon title for this morning, where is my clicker? I, have, I need my clicker. Is it down there? Thank you, Joel. <laughs> my sermon title for this morning is uh, called Heavenly Books, and I do have some slides on the screen that I will be inviting you to look at in, in a moment. I love books. Does anybody here love books? I love books. Um, I mean, I like the feel of the page, even the smell of the page. I know I'm not the only one out there that when you get a book, you just flip it by your nose and you smell those pages. That may sound strange, but for those of you who don't do it, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Um, I love, you know, I love the texture of books, um, uh, especially the covers if they're, you know, if they're bumpy and they have artistry work, the colors. I just, I just love books. And uh, what I really like about the printed page is that you can, uh, you know, make annotations, you can highlight, you can do that in electronic form as well. But it's just, for me, it's just not the same. And when books get worn out and you can flip through here and, and I see my notes and what I wrote and how I processed a certain paragraph. I mean, I just, I love books. And uh, the, uh, it's just, it's a really, uh, a really cool thing. I have to control myself and not buying too many books. I have a lot of them. Um, one of my fantasies is that I would love to go to the world's most beautiful libraries. And this is where I invite you to look on the screen with me. Um, here's a couple of libraries. This is the Trinity College Library in Dublin, and I wish we could have had faded this light so you can see the screen clear. Um, but this is in Dublin, Ireland. Here's another view of it. That's not a mirror image. Uh, you know, this is the top roof, those arches, and this is the bottom floor. I mean, just absolutely beautiful libraries. And I just want to share another one. This one is in and uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and it's called the Real Gabinete Portugues de Leitura. Um, it's the, it's uh, an official lecture uh, hall or library of the, of the cabinet of the government. And um, this, the picture on the slide really doesn't do justice because when I saw this, it, they separated the books in colors according to the binding of the colors, and it's, I mean, it's just absolutely gorgeous. I would love to see uh, libraries like this. There's a lot of famous books that, uh, good books that you have read. One of the most famous books uh, is this one that I have here in front of me, and it's called The Diary of Anne Frank. I don't know if you've read this book before. I'm reading it, and it's just fascinating, but um, I wanna share something with you, what she says, but let me just introduce, if none of you, if any of you don't know who Anne Frank is, um, she was born in the German city of Frankfurt, born on June 12, 1929, a long time ago. Um, Anne's, uh, Anne had a sister named Margot. She was about three years older than Anne was. And during this time, of course, Adolf Hitler, Hitler and his party were gaining more and more supporters. Um, Hitler hated the Jews and blamed them for the problems of society, as you know. And um, he took advantage of the rampant anti-Semitic sentiments in Germany. The hatred of Jews and the poor economic situation made Anne's parents, Otto and Edith, decide to move to Amsterdam. So from Germany to Amsterdam, um, Jews had to start wearing this, this star, of course, on their clothes. And there were rumors that all Jews would have to leave the Netherlands. And so Anne's parents ultimately decided to go into hiding to escape persecution. And uh, so in the spring of 1942, Anne's father, his name was Otto, Anne's father had started furnishing a hiding place in the annex of his business premises. Um, and before long, they were joined by four more people, and so the hiding place was cramped. So there was about eight, if I remember correctly, eight people in this very, very cramped, tight space 
uh, space. And of course, Anne, little Anne, had to be very quiet and she was much afraid. Well, on her 13th birthday, on Anne's 13th birthday, just before they went into hiding, she was presented with a diary. This is a, I think it was a birthday gift, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, birthday. And uh, during the two years in hiding, Anne wrote about events in this secret annex, but she also wrote down her feelings and thoughts, and she was quite the articulate person if you ever read her diary. And writing obviously helped her pass the time and just deal with her, you know, process her own inner world. In an early entry in her diary, Anne said that what prompted her to keep the diary was the fact that she didn't have a friend. This was just a few days after she received the diary. So she ended up calling her diary Kitty, K-I-T-T-Y. So it's interesting when you, when you read the entries, it'll say, Dear Kitty. Well, that's the name that she gave her diary. When the Minister of Education of the Dutch government in England made an appeal to Radio Orange, that's capital O, Radio Orange, to hold on to war diaries and documents, Anne was inspired to rewrite her individual diaries into one running story entitled The Secret Annex. And of course, we know this to be uh, the book today is the diary of Anne Frank. Anne and her older sister Margot ended up being sent to Auschwitz. I'm getting to the end part of her brief story here, her brief bio. And from there they were transported to Bergen, Bergen Belsen, a concentration camp near Hanover in Germany. The typhus epidemic that broke out in the winter of 1944 and 1945 as a result of this, uh, well, a pandemic broke out as a result of this, her, these horrendous um, hygiene conditions and um, killed thousands of prisoners including Margot, and a few day, uh, days later, unfortunately, it killed Anne. She must have died in February, in late February or early March, and she was only 15 years old. The bodies of both girls were probably dumped in Bergen-Belsen's mass graves. And uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, but unfortunately, the camp was liberated by British troops on April 12, 1945, just a, about a month after she had died and was put into this mass grave. Otto Frank, Anne's father, was the only one to survive these concentration camps. And until his death on August 18, 1980, living in Basel, Switzerland, he devoted himself to sharing the message of his daughter's diary with people all over the world. And at this point, I want to share just a couple of entries in what she says. This one, she's talking about uh, something that I think we would all agree with. And this is what she says. As you can no doubt imagine, we often say in despair, what's the point of the war? Why, oh, why can't people live together peacefully? Why all this destruction? The question is understandable, but so far no one has come up with a satisfactory answer. Why is England manufacturing bigger and better aeroplanes and bombs and at the same time churning out new houses for reconstruction? Why are millions spent on the war each day while not a penny is available for medical science, artists, or the poor? Why do people have to starve when mountains of food are rotting away in other parts of the world? Oh, why are people so crazy? I don't believe the war is simply the work of politicians and capitalists. Oh no, the common man is every bit as guilty. Otherwise, people and nations would have rebelled long ago. And then she says this, there's a destructive urge in people, the urge to rage, murder, and kill. And until all of humanity, without exception, undergoes a metamorphosis, wars will continue to be waged, and everything that has been carefully built up, cultivated and grown, will be cut down and destroyed, only to start all over again. You can hear Anne's frustration in what she's saying uh, for a little girl like this. And then this is the very last entry of her diary, which is August the 1st, 1944. This was the last entry. And of course, then she went into the, uh, these concentration camps where she obviously couldn't write. But this is what she says, and I, I love what she says here because you see this introspection happening here, and she was quite astute in her, her self-knowledge. Listen to what she says. As I've told you many times, and she's writing to Kitty her diary, so she personalizes the diary and saying you. 
As I've told you many times, I'm split in two. One side contains my exuberant cheerfulness, my flippancy, my joy in life, and above all, my ability to appreciate the lighter side of things. But that, excuse me, by that I mean not finding anything wrong with flirtations, a kiss, an embrace, a saucy joke. This side of me is usually lying in wait to ambush the other one, which is much purer, deeper, and finer. No one knows Anne's better side, and that's why most people can't stand me. Oh, I can be an amusing clown for an afternoon, but after that, but after that, everyone's had enough of me to last a month. Actually, I'm what a romantic film is to a profound thinker, a mere diversion, a comic interlude, something that is soon forgotten. Not bad, but not particularly good either. I hate having to tell you this, but why shouldn't I, why shouldn't I admit it when I know it's true? My lighter, more superficial side will always steal a march on the deeper side and therefore always win. You can't imagine how often I've tried to push away this Anne, which is only half of what is known as Anne, to beat her down, hide her, but it doesn't work, and I don't know why. I'm afraid that people who know me as I usually am will discover I have an other side, a better, finer side. I'm afraid they'll mock me, think I'm ridiculous and sentimental and not take me seriously. I'm used to not being taken seriously, but only the light-hearted Anne is used to it and can put up with it. The deeper Anne is too weak. If I force the good Anne into the spotlight for even 15 minutes, she shuts up like a clam the moment she's called upon to speak and lets Anne number one do the talking. Before I realize it, she's disappeared. Fascinating. I was just fascinated by, by these statements. Here she is analyzing her own inner world and herself and her psychology and her mental state and the struggle with these. She's not schizophrenic. That's, that's, not, that's not what's going on here. But she just understands herself. She has a person that's part of her that's one way in the public with other people and deep down inside. She's more of a serious individual. She wants to let that person out. But uh, perhaps it's insecurity. Um, we don't know. But uh, fascinating things in this book, the, Anne, uh, the Diary of Anne Frank. Books educate us. They inform us. They inspire. They can stir emotions. They tell us about history. If you go to our church website, tempeadventist.com, you'll see a PDF uh, document of our church bulletin. And in there is a quote from Viktor Frankl, another person who lived during Nazi Germany, but he survived. And this is what his quote says. The last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in, in excuse me, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. That's what he says. That's our last freedom. Now that inspires us. It inspires me. In Anne Frank's case, we are given a glimpse into her life, into her feelings, what happened on certain days uh, in her life or how she viewed her world. Her private thoughts to Kitty are now known the world over in book form. We have a common book that inspires and educates us, a book that we view as the words of God for us, a book that is the last word, and we call it the Bible. It's a book for all of humanity. That's what we believe. But the Bible also mentions a surprising detail in its pages. It mentions that there are heavenly books. Does this mean that these books are for God to read? Do angels spend delightful moments under a heavenly shade tree just to read a good book? Or to write something down like Anne Frank did and record it in a diary for it to be read by other angels? And if heaven is a place where there is perfect knowledge, then why do books exist in the first place? I want to invite you to look at the screen. We're going to look at some Bible passages that mention these books. And it's not in any particular order, but I want you to see, and it's not a comprehensive list, 
but it's a good solid list. And I want you to see some of these passages that talk about books um, in the Bible. Um, this is a picture of Anne Frank. I forgot, didn't put it on the screen before. Uh, that's her, uh, cute little girl, rambunctious and feisty little girl. Um, and unfortunately, she uh, passed away. Here's the, here are those verses. Psalm 69, verse 28. May they be blotted out of the book of life, and may they not be recorded with the righteous. And that's David in Psalms when he's talking about his enemies. May they be blotted out of the book of life. Here's a book mentioned. In this case, the book of life. Um, here's David again in Psalm 139. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. David says this to God. Even before I was born, you have a book that records all of the days that I were to live on this earth. And uh, he says this in Psalm 56, you have taken account of my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? I like this imagery here where he says uh, that God counts the number of tears that we have cried during our lives. <clears throat> and even those things are recorded in a book. Our sufferings, our hurts, our pains, our frustrations that have been expressed uh, through tears. This is what Malachi, this is our, our scripture reading for this morning. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of what? Remembrance. A book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. This is said of those who refused to complain. And then Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 14, Nehemiah says this, Remember me for this, O my God, and do not blot out my loyal deeds, which I have performed for the house of my God and its services. Now this is an inference for something that is recorded. And he's saying, please God, remember me. Don't blot out the good things that I have done for you. This is what David, again, going back to him, says in Psalm 109, 14, let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord and do not let the sin of his mother be blotted out. Strong language. This is what David is saying again um, in contra uh, to his enemies. And then this is from the book of Daniel, one of the most fascinating passages as far as books are concerned. Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. And the Ancient of Days, this is a reference to uh, the Heavenly Father, the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing out and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were open. This is a vision of Daniel that he has of a court scene slash judgment scene in heaven where it involves books being opened um, in, this, in this court uh, scene. And then, of course, Daniel again says at the uh, end of the book, chapter 12, verse 1, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. And he's uh, predicting, of course, a future deliverance. <clears throat> this passage comes from Exodus chapter uh, 32. But now, if you will forgive their sin, <clears throat> and if not, please blot me out from your book, which you have written. The Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. And this is a conversation, of course, between God and Moses, where God is uh, threatening because of the Israelites' continued rebellion. You know what? Let me just get rid of them, basically, is what God is saying. And Moses says, no, 
Um, he's intervening for them as a type of Christ figure, as a mediator. And he says, you know what, if you're not going to forgive them, then just blot me out of your book <clears throat> and uh, let them live is, is what Moses seems to be saying. This is what Jesus says himself to his disciples. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. The context of this passage is the disciples come back and they're excited and say, wow, I mean, we can exercise people and even the demons obey us by your name. And Jesus says, hey, that's cool, <clears throat> but don't let that flush you with pride and, and joy. Just rejoice with the fact that your names are recorded in heaven. <clears throat> and then Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. I'm almost finished here with this sampling of verses. Paul says, Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He writes this to the believers in Philippi. <clears throat> and then Revelations 3, 5. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And as you can see on the screen, <clears throat> there's lots of text in Revelation that mention books that I don't have time to mention, but I will mention this one. This is another major one. Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw a great white throne. Uh, John sees this in vision. And him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And what was open? Books. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. So clearly we see John, and this is the last text I'm sharing with you on the screen. Clearly what we're seeing is John is saying that there are books in heaven and there is another book, a distinct one from these books. This distinct one that stands all by itself in another category is called the book of life. And these other books, what he is saying, are things that people have done and they will be judged according to those things which they have done is what he is saying. Now, what are these books? Well, if you, grab, if you uh, gather together and just analyze all of these texts, what they seem to be are recordings. These books are recordings. We mentioned earlier about, you know, uh, tears uh, being written in the book. Tears in the bottle is how David poetically put it. Um, but they are recordings. They are people's experiences on earth. Their thoughts, their feelings, their deeds, their actions, their, their motives. These are recordings of people's experience. In other words, the life of each person, much like the diary of Anne Frank. But these record recordings are etched with such accuracy, with such depth and completeness, that they are completely without fault. They're not like the history books in, in, or school textbooks that may have biases depending on who writes them and what country they may originate from, or the very minute details available to the writer. For example, let me ask you this question. What do you think is the difference in the history, or written history, for the Battle of Palestine? Do you think a Jewish historian and a Palestinian historian would be at odds with each other in writing the history? Would they have dueling narratives writing about the same issue? I would say probably so. Edward Snowden was a whistleblower, or is a whistleblower, that copied and leaked highly classified information in 2013 from the National Security Agency while he was a CIA employee and subcontractor, Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, while he was employed there. Now, is he a traitor or is he a patriot? Were his motives good or evil? One book may tout him as a hero, while another one may describe him as a betrayer. How do you write that history? Who's right and who's wrong? 
A couple of years ago in 2018, Alex Rosenberg wrote a book, How History Gets Things Wrong. His premise is that we can only understand history if we don't convert it into a story, something that can end in disastrous results. According to him, narrative history can be misguided. But these recordings in heaven have the history of every human life even before they were born. Again, according to Psalm 139.16, when David said, in your book were all written the days that were ordained before me, unquote. It records our feelings, our thoughts, every single experience until our death. And because they are in heaven, we can safely assume the terrible accuracy of what is written. They don't tell a story from a biased partisan deity, but record in a factual way who I am, who you are. And Frank was trying to figure out who she was. Well, these book uh, record exactly the type of person that is speaking to you right now and the type of person that is listening to me. It's like a mirror following us day and night that reflects our very thinking, our very intentions and devisings, things that are hidden from everybody else. And of course, our acts, whether in public or private. Mirrors are not biased. They reflect what is true. These are narratives of our lives, but not as Alex Rosenberg understands a narrative. This has accuracy, and they're unmistakably correct. That's what these books seem to be. They are recordings. Now, another question or a question I ask is, why books in heaven? Why are there books in heaven? Um, does God really need to have something recorded? Much like those libraries that you saw in the pictures earlier, does God have a heavenly library, library where there are billions and billions of volumes and they're all categorized and this is uh, this culture, or this is this person. Are they, are they divided by last name, by location? Is that what God has? Does God need a library of heavenly congress to record everything, either in analog or digital format? Well, I'm not sure about that. Are there miles of bookshelves in heaven? And are these books literal? Well, I have some verses I'd like to share with you uh, regarding God. God, the Bible portrays, is a God of omniscience. In other words, perfect knowledge, full knowledge. There is no error in what God knows, and He knows everything. Let me just share a few verses with you. These are not on the screen. Psalm 147 and verse 5 says this, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. You just cannot measure how much God understands. Psalm 139 verse 4. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Even before the thought is processed, even before it is uh, birthed, God already knows what we, we, what we will think. He already knows what I'm going to be thinking in five seconds from now. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and, uh, and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. We're all disrobed mentally, emotionally, experientially before the maker of the universe. And Romans chapter 11, verse 33 says this, Oh, the depth. This is Paul praising God for something that he just cannot understand, but he's praising God anyways. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. And there are multiple passages that tout God's perfect knowledge and His omniscience. So I relate the, I share these passages with you because when I read things like this, I come away with the conclusion, God doesn't need any books. Why would He need a book? To remember something? Did he forget? Oh, I wonder what this uh, person did you know, uh, 3,000 years ago. Uh, angel number one, can you get me the book in this category? It's over there on the very, very top shelf. You'll have to fly up about 20 miles up. 
Does God actually need books? Of course He doesn't. His knowledge is perfect. He does not need any books to remember uh, something that has occurred here on planet Earth in the lives of human beings. So again, let me go back. These books seem to be utilized as evidence, recordings that are evidence. Going back to Daniel chapter 7 especially, where the Ancient of Days and his, he has this uh, fiery blazing throne and thousands upon thousands, and I would say millions are attending him in, angel, uh, in the form of angels and heavenly beings. And it's just a huge, huge court scene, which is in Daniel chapter 7. And the Bible says there, the court sat and the books, plural, were opened in this heavenly judgment scene. And of course, in Revelation chapter 20, I want to read these verses again. If you want to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20, and I'll just read it from the Scriptures. And it says here, verse 12, uh, I'll start with verse 11, in Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their, de to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Now, I know what you're thinking at this time, or I, I know what you're feeling. I can just feel the vibes uh, filtering through the camera lens. All of this may sound very scary. This scrutiny, this judgment. We are naked before God. There is not one thought, one intention, one motive, one plan, one deed, one word. Nothing is hidden from God. Nothing. It is impossible. We are completely exposed before God. And the way I live my life, the way I, even my intentions, my motives, the hidden things that you can't even see, even those things are recorded in the books. And so I know how you're feeling right now. You're feeling a little bit scared. You may be shaking in your seat right now as you're listening to me because of this information, because of these books that record, that, are, that, are, that act as evidence. Now these books, as you have rightly concluded, have to do with judgment. Books are opened and people are judged according to the things that are written in it. Everything. So these books in heaven have, are related, intimately related with judgment. Not only judgment, but in a great degree to judgment. And the reason why I say not only is because Scripture talks about forgiveness. It talks about pardon. It talks about mercy. And I'm just thinking of a passage right now in Psalm 103. One of my favorite passages, if you have your Bibles, open your books to Psalm 103. Fascinating verse that I like to connect with this presentation about books and things being recorded because what we tend to do in hearing information like this one of our first reactions is oh, oh everything is being recorded in these books of heaven that is our human tendency to think oh, oh because we usually have something that we don't want anybody else to know and yet they're recorded in heaven that tends to be our first reaction but listen to what Psalm 103 says. This is David speaking. He says this, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Verse 10. He has not dealt with us according to our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. 
As far as the east is from the west, you can't measure that. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. This is what the Bible says. And so in case you're one of those, and I assume that you are, that get a little bit nervous in hearing this uh, information from the Bible regarding the books, may I remind you that God is a merciful and gracious God. Paul said it this way in, Rome, in the book of Romans. He said, where sin abounds, and of course, we can't spread our arms wide enough to try and embrace how abounding sin is, not only in, in, in this world, but even in our selfish motives and deeds that we do sometimes. Where sin abounds, Paul says, grace does much more abound. I remember I preached uh, a sermon titled uh, uh, Grace, I believe. And um, I like to look at, I like to try and find images or pictures that will illustrate what uh, the concept that I want to share. And, I'll, and sometimes I'll do that with the very first, if I make a presentation with slides, sometimes I'll put a picture of, as the very first slide to illustrate the concept. Well, in this case, um, years ago I preached a sermon on, on that text in Romans, where, grace, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. So I thought, well, how can I illustrate that grace abounds and is bigger than sin? And so I found a really, really cute picture on Google. It was a picture white background, so it was a, obviously a, a photography, pure white background, and there was a big Great Dane. Oh, those are big dogs. A big Great Dane sitting down, his paws in front of him, and looking down. And right next to him was a tiny little chihuahua about that big looking up. It was a cute picture. And I thought, that's a perfect illustration of how grace abounds where sin abounds. In this case, of course, the chihuahua, in my mind, was illustrating sin. And the Great Dane was illustrating grace. You cannot out -sin God in the sense that God will ha not have enough grace to cover your sin. Can't do that. God's grace will abound much, much more. So I say this in the form in terms of comfort and hope in talking about these books and how they are intimately acquainted with final judgment. Remember this, that mercy and forgiveness are also recorded. Mercy and forgiveness are also recorded. In this sense, when we ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sin, they are blotted, they are forgiven, and they are blotted out. So when the final, in Revelation chapter 20, some call this the great white throne judgment or the Bema seat judgment. When that day comes, and if we have asked the Lord to forgive us of our sins, not at not being presumptuous and using God's grace as permission to just live out our lives the way we so please when, they're against, when our deeds and thoughts go against God's word. That's not how grace works. But when we sincerely, re sincerely repent of our wrongdoings, of my lack of integrity, of my uncircumspected, uh, uh, uncircumspect life, of my selfish deeds, my tendency to put self first, or things that I just abjectly do wrong. When I sincerely ask God to forgive me of those things that are written, remember, these books have all of the deeds written. When I ask God to forgive me at the final judgment, He not only forgives me, but 1 John 1, 9 says, He will not only forgive us, but He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're at that final judgment. We have no fear of those things that are written in the books because Jesus said, what sin? It's not recorded here. You would ask forgiveness. I love this statement by one of our founders of the Seventh Adventist Church, Ellen White. She says that when we sin and when we ask God for forgiveness, sincerely, with a sincerely repentant heart, she says, Christ will forgive us as if we have never sinned. That is called righteousness by faith. That's called justification. And this is the great hope, and this is what is extended to all of humanity. Righteousness by faith. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him, whoever believes in Him, doesn't matter who you are, whoever believes in Him 
will not experience death, eternal death, but will have eternal life. That is justification by faith because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we talk about these books in heaven, God doesn't need those books to remember anything. And those books, those things that are recorded in those books, if we sincerely ask God to forgive us, He will be merciful to us. The last and final thing I want to say regarding these books, if these books exist, which they do, we just read the biblical evidence for that, if God is, is an omniscient God and He doesn't need books, and if our sins can be blotted out because of Christ's forgiveness through His shed blood on the cross, if all of this is true, well, the question still remains, why are there books? Why are there books? I intimated it earlier that they are used for judgment, but nevertheless, why would God need a book to look at? And uh, John Smith, okay, John Smith, uh, page 1,532. Okay, John Smith, all right, this is uh, what happened on such and such a day. Books will be used for judgment. Do, do we actually believe that God needs need these books? I say no. Let me invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 12 in attempting to answer this question. Revelation chapter 12. The Bible says here, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. This describes a war in all places in heaven itself. Now, when we think of heaven, we think of a place that is harmonious, peaceful. You want to be there. Um, you know, great place to be. Everybody loves each other. Everybody gets along. Um, there's no rebellion. There's no mutiny. There's no selfishness. Um, it's just a great place. But what's strange, strange as it may seem, there was war in heaven, and Satan, the devil, in verse 9, it's, it's, it says that the dragon was, is the devil, there was a rebellion in heaven, and the Bible says that he drew a third. 33% of the heavenly angels sided with him in this rebellion, and they were kicked out of heaven, and, uh, which uh, would seem to tell us undoubtedly that there was no remedy. We don't have the minute details in the Bible of, of, uh, of how God dealt with this in the sense of conversations with Lucifer, um, trying to, uh, you know, give him his love and trying to talk to him and just sit down. And let's talk about these things and why are you saying this, etc. We don't have those those behind the scenes uh, details, but nevertheless, there we have a little bit of that in Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight, where it would seem that the devil, um, in the spiritual form, described as the king of Tyre, but the, in the spiritual form, being the devil seems to have involved, been involved in merchandise or trading, which was gossip and, and, uh, and just uh, you know, defaming God's name in heaven. Um, we don't have time to look that in detail, but that's in Ezekiel. So this is what happened in heaven. There was a rebellion in heaven, and I would say that it was just one of the saddest events that happened in the uh, universe, the saddest probably in the universe, in the history of the universe, was this entrance of sin that began in heaven in the heart of Lucifer. Now, you may be wondering where I'm going with this, so just be patient with me. I wanted to mention that first and foremost. Now, the Bible tells us, and I just read it in John 3, 16, whoever believes in Jesus Christ will not perish, but will have everlasting life will not perish, will have everlasting life. You know as well as I do that our consistency as human beings is not always up to par with perfection. 
Um, and this is what Paul seems to be talking about in his theology, what I call his theology of self in Romans chapter 7. Paul will say things like this, you know, I agree that the law of God is good, and I concur in my heart that the law of God is good, and I love God with all of my heart. He'll say things like this. And of course, this is Paul talking. But in Romans 7, he describes this theology of self where he says, but I don't understand myself. You know, those things that I don't agree with, those things that I don't like, those things that I hate, I'll do those things. And then he'll say, and those things that I, what I know to be right, those things that I want to do, those things that I love, those things that I agree with in, in my heart of hearts, way down deep inside, I agree this is the right thing I want to do. He says, I won't do those things. Now, I don't believe that Paul is talking about a consistent pattern of re deliberate rebellion against God. That's not what I believe what Paul is doing. What he is saying is that he recognizes in himself that there are two natures. There's this one nature that wants to put self first and wants to do kind of veer off the track, the straight and narrow. And there's this other self of him that knows that, yeah, but, you know, down deep inside, in my soul, I love God. And I want to do and think right 100% of the time. And he realizes that's not always what happens in this life. So what are we to do? What are we to do? What's the answer? Well, one of the things is that God helps us to overcome our selfish, sinful tendencies. Remember, sin, S-I-N, is self-inflicted nonsense, S-I-N. God helps us to overcome these things. And the Apostle John says, uh, my beloved, he says, I write to you so that you won't sin. He says, I write to you that you won't sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for those of the whole world. And this, are the, these are, this concurs with what Paul says. Paul says, um, should we sin? No, God forbid that we sin. And then John says here, but if in case that happens, which it does, and this isn't presumption, if it happens where we did not resist by the grace of Jesus Christ, and if it happens, Jesus can forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, why am I saying all this? What does this all have to do with judgment? That judgment back in Daniel 7, where the court sat and the books were open, the judgment in Revelation chapter 20, where everyone is before the great white throne and death and Hades give up the dead and the sea gives up the dead and everybody is judged according to what is written in the books. And if their name is not found in the book of life, then they will be thrown into the burning lake of fire. This is what Revelation 20 says. Here's the thing. Before that great white throne judgment, before God's people are captured into heaven and get to live with Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you think, because of the rebellion and Revelation chapter 12, wouldn't you think that all of heaven, the angelic beings, and as I believe, even the inhabited worlds in space that we know nothing of, where there, where, where there is uh, sinlessness, wouldn't you think that all of the heavenly beings that do not have the knowledge and wisdom of God. The angels are not omniscient. Only God is. Angels are not omniscient. Never in the Bible does it describe as an angel as omniscient. Powerful and perfect they are, but not omniscient. Wouldn't you think that those who confess faith in Jesus Christ and, and God accepts them and they end up going to heaven, wouldn't you think that the angels want to make sure that rebellion doesn't happen a second time? How are they to know? This is my take on these passages and this concept of judgment and the books. If God does not need any books because he has perfect knowledge, who in heaven that resides in heaven does not have the perfect knowledge of God, then who are these books are for? I submit to you that these books are for the heavenly beings who do not have the intimate, profound, perfect knowledge that God has. Not that they're sinful, but they're not divine. These books are written for them, are written for us, 
so that everything is recorded, God will invite the angelic host and say, before I invite anybody to heaven, here, you can look at these books and see if I'm right or wrong and deciding this person should be saved and this person, person not. That, I'm referencing Daniel chapter 7 in that case. And in Revelation chapter 20, if the saints are in heaven with Jesus Christ, on thrones, reigning with Christ for a thousand years in heaven, and the wicked dead are dead on earth, they were not resurrected at the second coming of Christ. They will be resurrected until after the thousand years. They will be resurrected again in order to be judged. And Jesus says this. He says there are two resurrections. A resurrection for the righteous, for eternal life, and a resurrection to condemnation. So after the thousand year period, and at the end of the thousand years, I'll go this way, at the end of the thousand years, there's a resurrection of the wicked to be judged before the great white throne, Revelation chapter 20. Who will be looking at the books of those individuals? It is the saints who are in heaven with Jesus Christ, reigning as kings and priests on thrones. If I'm in heaven, and if you're in heaven, we will have the privilege of looking at these records, these books in heaven, and seeing how God had decided no, this person was not saved. They may have confessed Jesus, but look at their life record. Look at their motives. Look at their intentions. It is the saints that will be on thrones judging. In fact, Paul says this, and this will be my last text I want to share with you today. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, this is what Paul says. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm sorry. In verse 2, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Verse 3, Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? This is what the, Paul, the Apostle Paul is saying. That the saints, the believers of God, will judge the world and will judge angels. Well, that is certainly not taking place now. And this is where it fits with Revelation chapter 20 during the thousand years in heaven. I know I have opened up a huge topic on that one. And in the future, I will need to explain in more detail the events surrounding the thousand years, the millennium as it's called. But I want to encourage you, when we are talking about these heavenly books, number one, I know it's a scary thing to think about. But if we have that relationship with Jesus and we're spending time with him and our hearts have been surrendered to Jesus Christ and every day we're asking Jesus, please help me to surrender my will to you, Jesus. Help me to do this, please. The Lord will give us the strength that we need. He will give us the victory that we need and we will experience the joy of salvation. We will experience the peace and joy that only Christ can give us, not as the world gives, but only as Christ can give us, we will experience that. We will experience the victory that Paul talks about, where by faith and by prayer and by resistance in the power of God, the devil will flee from us. We can experience these things. We can experience forgiveness and grace. So there's no need to fear the future. There's no need to fear the judgment if we are in this category of faithful heart believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. But unfortunately for those who do not have that relationship with Christ, these things, these sins, these failures, uh, these character defects that have not been uh, transformed into the image of Christ while on earth, these deliberate sins, these hidden uh, selfish sinful motives, if there is no repentance, unfortunately for those individuals, there will be judgment according to those things written uh, in heaven. So, God is good. God is good. He is the best record keeper. There will be no mistake about it in the history of the universe in the future. Everything that God has decided in, the, in terms of saving one person and one person not eventually being saved, everything will be recorded and we will all come to agreements with God according to these things that have been recorded in these books.